if you're the kind of sports fan who's a casual observer of the entire sports landscape, the kind of person who leaves Sports Center on in the morning instead of Good Morning America or cable news, or you pick up the USA Today or local newspaper just for the sports section, or it's 2021, so your Twitter and TikTok followers are people who cover the full gambit of sports. You're the kind of person who may recognize the name of our subject today. You know his name from awards, and you may conjure an image of the stadium that bears his name, but for many people, that's likely all you know. This is what you don't know about Arthur Ashe. Welcome to What You Don't Know About Sports, where we delve into the forgotten stories, teams, and athletes of sports history and question widely held takes on today's sports. I'm Matt, and this is Blake. Hiya. And today we have a story about tennis legend Arthur Ashe. Blake, how good are you at the game of tennis? See, it's not about how good I am. It's about how much (laughs) fun it is to play. I wish I played more of it. I have not played enough of it or taken it seriously when I have had a tennis racket in my hand. Normally, it's just fun to basically hit home runs, but with a tennis ball and the tennis racket. Like That's just the funnest part, you know, for someone who doesn't really take the sport of tennis seriously when I've ever done it. But I would love to do it more regularly. I will say that I tell my wife every time that we go by a public park with a tennis court or... Every time we see a nice one, I'm like, you know what we should do? We should just go and buy some like half decent tennis rackets and a, a ball, of ten, a bag of tennis balls, and and just go out there one day and just just hit the ball back and forth and see how it goes. And she's like, yeah, that's a great idea. And then of course, hasn't happened yet. So maybe one day I will. Uh, I would take the the sport of tennis more seriously. Have you ever played? Yeah, I uh, I am I am a very much a novice in the game of tennis. Uh, But both of my both of my brothers are fairly skilled. I have one brother that uh, was a collegiate athlete for a bit playing tennis. So shout out to him. But I am not that good at tennis. And so the the problem becomes the problem becomes for me with the whole idea of, of just grab some rackets and let's grab some balls and we'll just hit it back and forth is that at some point somebody gets competitive and you start putting the ball in weird places and then it's not fun anymore. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's competition, which is fun. It's enjoyable, but, um, but I'm not good enough to facilitate that competitive desire. So I don't know. I just need practice. So that would be me. I'm, I'm like, I'm the one that's like somebody accidentally hits it a little bit too far away from you and you have to, you just have to run just a little bit. Then you're like, okay, okay. You, you think I'm going to run for this ball and then you hit it harder. And then, then, then you start keeping count. You're like, Oh, that's three in a row for you. Or that's three in a row for me. And and then everybody gets mad and then somebody gives up. No, no, I give up. I'm just kidding. No, it it would be fun though. (laughs) I, I would totally do it more. Yeah. I need to, I need to practice. I just need to get better. But I guess that's a lot of things, you know. You could say that about thousands of, of activities. I just need to practice a little bit. So that's why we're not pros. But this man that we're going to talk about today is and was a pro. So let's jump in to the story about Arthur Ashe. He was born July 10th, 1943 in Richmond, Virginia. So shout out to our all of our Virginia listeners um, his life went pretty well uh, for the first few years. His mother was very intent that he would learn at an early age. And so by the age of four, he was reading, which would have been a, a pretty a pretty good achievement for that time. And uh, things were going well until the age of six. His mother actually passed away when he was just six years old. And as a result of that, his father 
kind of brought in some discipline, extra um, kind of strict discipline into the home to try and keep his children on the right path. Uh, Arthur Ashe actually has a quote that says, I had 12 minutes to get home from school and I kept that rule through high school. So that's the kind of like discipline. Like you, you needed to be, I know what time school gets out. I know how long it takes you to get here. You need to be home by this time. Cause you're not going to go do one of these other things, you know? I'm glad I didn't have that rule. For one thing, <laughs> I think my I think my high school was farther than 12 minutes away from my house. But any even if even if I had a rule that was that was halfway realistic for me to get home from high school after I got my car, nah. Nah, that's that's not how that worked, but but good for him, good for good for Arthur's father for for making the best out of a bad situation, you know, like if 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 that's what it takes for if that's what it takes to keep the family together then that's that's what you had to do and it worked out well for him I think right yeah it it, it went well he graduated very high in his high school class so no problems there uh, also while living with his father at the age of 7 I always think this is interesting like how like we know that like baseball players basketball players football players soccer players they get introduced to those games at a very early age and like you're playing it because there's just a ball in the house. There's a bunch of kids in the neighborhood that play. And generally those are kind of low cost sports. You can play them. Um, If one kid in the neighborhood has the equipment, you're good to go or you just make shift the stuff you need to to start playing. But, you know, we always think of tennis and golf as those kind of country club stereotype sports. They're more costly. They're more, elite and so it's kind of harder to figure out how those how people that play those sports get started and so for arthur ash it was at the age of seven so it was at a young age his father took a job uh near a park that was reserved in richmond for african americans and it happened to have tennis courts so while hanging out with his dad at work or just looking for something to do while his dad was working he would go to the park and play tennis on the courts that were there. So he does have kind of that, that normal uh, introduction to the sport in this case being tennis. So I think that's cool that, that even he kind of looks like his dad, even, even when he's working, he's, he's thinking about, you know, how do I make sure the kids have something productive to do um, while I'm working? So I think that's cool too. That is very interesting. Cause yeah, I always wonder like, the 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 child prodigies like did they how did they get started like was it was it forced was it was it like a forced labor kind of thing like my favorite sport is x and you as my child this that's the sport i know the most about so i can get you started at that sport at the youngest possible age and and like part of me thinks that a lot of time that could ruin a kid because like you, you at some point you got to just you got to let them make their own decisions you can't be real forceful about it but at the same time if it's something that they're showing interest in and i'm sure that that Arthur Ash had an had an interest in tennis it's this wasn't one of those forced type situations so i'm really glad it worked out yep while he was in Richmond playing in the park he encountered uh, legendary and Hall of Fame coach, Dr. Robert Walter Johnson Jr. Johnson was a coach to another very important African-American tennis player, Althea Gibson. She was the first African-American champion of Wimbledon. And so uh, he is a well-thought-of figure in the tennis community, he had been a big part of the community of tennis players in Lynchburg, which is about a two hour drive from Richmond. So he's getting some elite coaching at a very young age, which I think is key uh, to him becoming what he would become. So not only is he finding the game of tennis early on, he's finding the game of tennis and he's linking up with some, some very important and very skilled people at an early age, somebody that's, that's coached a Wimbledon champion already. Like this isn't, he's not coaching Althea Gibson at the same time. He's already coached Althea Gibson. And now he's working with uh, a young Arthur Ashe. 
I need somebody like that to show up at my city park because <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to I'm going to walk over with my kids and just sit them down and be like, watch and learn. Just let them let them have a minute. You know, that that's also how it starts. They have to they have to be introduced to it. They have to they have to show an interest in it and they have to have somebody who knows a little bit about what they're what the sport is about to to be able to guide them from a very early age and to be able to see if, see the potential in the child. So, uh, that, that is, that's crazy that that's how, that's how he got his start was, was with, with, with a, with a coach who has already coached a, a Wimbledon champion. Kind of a right place, right time situation. As he grew up, he's going to leave Richmond, Virginia, for the purposes of tennis, they, uh, Johnson believes that he needs to be he need to be around better players, and so he moves to St. Louis, Missouri, uh, and he stays with an acquaintance of Johnson, who is another big figure in tennis and is another trailblazer for African Americans in tennis. He stays with Richard Hudlin. Hudlin had gone to the University of Chicago in the nineteen twenties and was the first African-American to play tennis in the Big Ten. Now, some of you are raising your eyebrows and scratching your heads and thinking uh, Chicago's not in the Big Ten. They don't even play sports, I don't think. And so that may be true today. But in the 1920s, Chicago was a member of the Big Ten. If you if you look at the um, whatever association it is that all those Big Ten universities are a part of, Chicago is a member of that association too and so when they were playing sports they played in the big 10 and uh, hudlin would go on to be a teacher in st louis and sued the city of st louis to have the tennis courts open to all races tennis courts like many other things in the country were segregated at the time and it just happened to be that all the parks and all of the the places where tennis courts were located were white only and so he sued that they should be open to everyone. And he won that suit. And as a result, St. Louis became a hotbed for African-American players. Althea Gibson stopped there in her youth. Arthur Ashe goes in his youth. And it's there that under the tutelage of Hudlin that Arthur Ashe cultivates the style of serve and volley, uh, which you don't see very much. I do know if, enough about tennis to know this. You don't see that style very often today. It's mostly just, you know, rip a serve and then they stand on the baseline, pounding the ball back and forth until somebody screws up. Uh, you don't see a lot of people just serving and going straight to the net, but Ash did. Uh, and, and that's where he learned to do it. It's a style that's going to serve him well. And also there in St. Louis, he appeared in Sports Illustrated, I remember that was so cool to be in Sports Illustrated. Uh, he was a face in the crowd. So that was a section that they ran every week that highlighted high school athletes, maybe some JUCO or, or college athletes you may not have heard of before and just kind of talked about him. He was highlighted there in 1960. And then he graduated first in his class in high school. So like you were saying, all this stuff worked out. The discipline worked out for him. So he's He's good at school and he's good at tennis as he graduates high school. You you have to love these stories where it just works out for some people. You know, like people go through some of the worst things and then like 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 his mother dying when he was only 6 years old. I can't imagine he ever had that much memory of her because he was 6 and and now he's I mean Kudos to his father, because to to send your son to another state at that time in like the 50s, to send your son to another state to trust this dude who has coached a Wimbledon champion before, co- to trust him enough to send him, not with him, but with somebody he knows in, a, in multiple states over in one of the biggest cities in, in the country to let him go and learn tennis there. Then Hudlin sues the city to give access to tennis courts for all African-Americans in the city, basically. When's that? I mean, it's like 
you have to love these stories where where it just seems like everything is working in his favor after of course the uh, uh not not including the death of his mother of course but but as far as his tennis and athletics go and even schooling i mean you you have to love these sort of stories it just works out for him it's truly it 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 make it gives you hope right <laughs> that 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 uh that things can can work out they can turn around and, and you can you can make things happen he became, and I just want to mention one thing during this time where he's in St. Louis, one of the sources I was looking at said that he won a junior national championship in 1960 and 1961, but I could not corroborate that anywhere else. So uh, if anybody else is a, a tennis historian and wants to get back to us on that, uh, that's just a question from me. I'm not sure if that happened or not. But he did move up to become the fifth-ranked junior in the country by the time he graduated high school and went to school at UCLA. While he was there, he won the 1965 Individual National Championship in tennis, and so naturally, as a result of that, was a key contributor to UCLA winning the team's national championship that year as well so he's an individual national champion he's a team national champion by the time he ends his college career one other interesting piece there there he's also going to become the first african-american recruited recruited to the davis cup and if you're unfamiliar with the davis cup this is kind of a team tennis competition that would essentially be the world cup for tennis our best tennis players group together play uh, head-to-head with some you know one other country in kind of a tournament format to see who the best country is at tennis. It's less of a big deal. It's kind of the, it's more of a equivalent of the Ryder cup or the president's cup in golf. But I think those two things both get more uh, coverage and in high level participation than the Davis cup does. But at that time it was, it was a big deal for tennis uh, to have these, these countries competing against one another. So there you go. Another, another achievement for Ash uh, early on in his career. You mentioned in the open how unless you really just, like if unless you're the type of person who leaves sports center on all day every day or listens to ESPN radio or sports radio all day every day, you you may not be aware of anything other than the award in his name. If you were even aware of that, which is it's fine if you weren't, especially if you're of our generation where he he passes away at a fairly young age for himself, but also very early on in my life too. So I never got to see him play tennis, but you may not know of of anything that he did on the court. You may only know him for the Arthur Ashe Award for Courage that's given out at the ESPYs. And you don't get that award by just being an advocate. You have to also have been good at your craft if you are an athlete slash advocate. Like if, if Muhammad Ali wasn't who he was in the boxing ring, what he said outside of it, no one would have listened. But because of how good he was, and this is the similar situation is, now I'm starting to understand, I didn't know that much about his tennis career, like most other people. And so I'm starting to understand why people listened to him, why they paid attention to him with what he was saying off the court. It's because he was damn good at tennis, okay? <laughs> Whether that's uh, we're, we're not even into his pro career yet, but he's probably 20. 122 at this point and he's just getting started yep all right we're gonna pause right there for a little game we like to call stump the sykes uh this one is relatively easy it's not actually relatively easy because i was blissfully unaware of this fact before uh before i read about it so uh shout out so i'm not real sure how we're gonna play this but we're gonna give it a go so in most tennis tournaments, there are three surfaces that you play on or could play on. There's grass, famously, you play on at Wimbledon. There's clay that we get on at the French Open. Then there's the hard courts that you play on at the U.S. Open and the Australian Open. However, in the 1950s, the 1960s, even earlier, there was one other surface that people played on. In particular, this one was featured heavily in St. Louis, where Ash was. He learned this serve and volley game on a very special type of court. I guess you could have 10 questions to try and figure out what this surface (laughs) 
was. Can you tell me okay. the fourth type of playing surface for tennis? So clay, grass, yep. and hard yep. court. Yes. What would they have used in the 50s? Yeah. For tennis courts. The only, th- well, I, I, I'll give, I think I only have one guess. Like, <laughs> I don't think I can. Okay, maybe. No, that wouldn't work. Maybe. Okay, I think I do. Okay, I have two guesses. Man. Okay. It's like rattling my brain. Okay. I just had, I got two. I don't know of any other way to narrow down, like, okay. surface playing types. But, oh, no. So I'm going to guess asphalt. It's actually not a bad guess. It's not the right answer, although I'm sure it is a right answer. I'm imagining I, there's got to be somebody that played tennis. Someone on might asphalt. have played on asphalt at some point, right? Yes. But that's um, not this answer, no. My other guess would be some sort of sand material, but that would that would be really soft, right? That would that would not. I don't I don't think you would get a bounce from no, that. No, probably not. It would have to be real compact. Um So it's not asphalt and it's not sand. Huh. Are any other sports played on this type of surface? There are other sports played on this type of surface. Other sports? Oh, there is a there's... sport played on this type of surface. If I just ask for what that sport is, would you give it to me? <laughs> it would it would give you the answer, but I suppose if you ask specifically what sport <laughs> it's kind of it cheating. would uh, um outdoor I'm, I'm I'm assuming it's it's an outdoor sport that plays on this surface. The the uh, the this sport is played mostly indoors. Mostly indoors. When played outdoors, it is played on asphalt, but mostly played indoors. Wood? They played tennis on wood. Out Really? They played tennis on wood. I cannot oh, cool. imagine playing tennis. On, I mean, I can't imagine playing tennis on wood. I can't imagine when you want to go die for a ball playing tennis on wood. Because uh, that's... I mean, but I guess you die for balls in basketball. You just got to get over the burn. Hardcore would be the same way, right? Like I would. That's actually yeah. worse if we're thinking about it to to dive on one of those those hard courts. Ooh, cut up everything. Yeah, I, f- I feel it in my knees. <laughs> just sitting here. But yeah, wood court tennis was the thing. Outdoors? That's wild. I'm not sure if it was outdoors. Say, that would indoors. that would be wild. How would they protect that? Yeah, I think it would oh. have to be indoors. indoor. Indoor tennis. tennis. That's pretty sick. Yeah, indoor wood tennis. There you go. Didn't know it. Till the more you know. That's it. All right, so uh, so back to our, our profile here, here on Arthur Ashe. This is the part of the story where I would typically tell you about the person's pro career, but Arthur Ashe is not a normal story. So he actually begins his post-college career by joining the Army, where he served from 1966 through 1968, so a two-year commitment in the army where he would be promoted to the rank of second lieutenant by the time that he was discharged. And it was still as a member of the U S army that he shocked the world becoming the first African American to win the United States open in 1968. He shocked the world because not only was he still in the army, he was still an amateur tennis player. 1968 is generally uh, or is recognized as the beginning of what's called the open era in tennis, which is when professionals began playing the Grand Slam tournaments and the largest tournaments that there were. Uh, before that time, you had to be an amateur in order to participate. Ash still was an amateur. As a matter of fact, not only did he win the U.S. Open that year, he won the U.S. Amateur that year and it became the first person and to this date the only person to win both of those tournaments in the same year and he won both in 1968 the story is that when he returned to his post after the tournament he got a standing ovation from his fellow fellow soldiers afterwards which you know that checks out because why wouldn't you applaud the dude who just went (laughs) uh on leaving when the u.s opened so there you go wow uh, yeah, I wonder. I wonder if that's one of those that'll never be broken, just because of, just because of how professionalism is now and how much higher 
how much higher their level of play would be versus versus the amateur players back then they were they were a little more intermingled i would think and and today you would think that the professionals are just so far ahead like it could, like could you imagine one of the big 3 who play today uh losing to i mean i guess it's possible but i don't know i don't know if you're that good at that age are you playing the us amateur right uh are you just are you just focusing on the us open and, and calling it a day so i mean i i think you're i mean i think that may be something that we don't ever see we may see people who win the us amateur obviously grow up and win the us open but i i don't the, in the same year though like yeah. like to do both i would imagine you're doing one or the other but i I, it can't. I don't think it's a never say never type situation. I mean, Tiger, you know, won his first Masters technically still as an amateur, right? So, I mean, that's another sport, but still, I think I think it's possible uh, that that a collegian just gets an entry into the U.S. Open somehow and and makes their way through on some run. I don't know, but yeah, that's it's a crazy situation to be an amateur, to be in the Army, and you win both of the biggest tournaments on that, that the USTA runs. I think that's cool. After his discharge from the army, he does start playing professional tennis and he would go on to win his second grand slam two years later by winning the Australian open in 1970. Now he's not the first African American, uh, to win there, but he is the first African American man to win the Australian open. Now, This is where we're going to integrate some weirdness about professional tennis because I didn't realize how crazy the formation of professional tennis was. It was like the wild, wild west. So his his 1970 Australian Open win, he gets credit for it, shouldn't be diminished, but the best players in the world all weren't there. Some... Uh, of the best players in the world were barred from playing. Some had boycotted playing in the Australian Open because in the immediate uh, beginning of the Open Air, several different organizations tried to show up and run professional tennis. Before the Open Air, the International Lawn Tennis Federation, now the International Tennis Federation, because apparently lawn tennis is like a special thing, um, ran all of the big tournaments. As soon as the open air hit, some promoters got together and started signing up. This is, to me, it relates a lot to boxing, the way different boxing promoters, like I fight for Showtime, I fight for HBO, I fight for whatever, whoever, you know, Oscar De La Hoya, Golden Boy, that's it. And so you only fight people either in your promotion or, you know, if they're outside of your promotion, you have to like jump through 85,000 hoops and there's eight different or four different groups that, you know, hand out championship belts. It's just disjointed and confusing. That's how professional tennis was. There was a world championship tennis. There was a world league tennis. There was a national tennis league. Uh, there was a world team tennis, which still exists to this day for like a novelty, a kind of older player uh, thing. But all of these organizations started contracting players to only play in their events. So you may go to a tournament and it's a world championship tennis event. You're only seeing WCT players there. You go to a national tennis league event. It's only those guys there. And so the international tennis federation started getting like shaky about this and started being like, uh, those guys can't play here. Those guys can't play here. These people can't play here. Oh, you turned down the Davis Cup to go play in one of these events? You're out. And so it started to have, we started to get like even slams have fields that weren't filled with the very best players every single year. And this actually leads into another thing that Ash did. So he was a member of World Championship Tennis. We're going to leave, I think, what may be our fourth or fifth shout out to this person. World Championship Tennis was run by Lamar Hunt. He keeps coming up, right? The inventor of the, the name, the Super Bowl. Uh, he's been in a couple of other, of other episodes. And so he was there. Eventually, he would group up with 
uh, a group of other players to create the Association of Tennis Players, or ATP, which if you know anything about tennis now, it's the ATP Tours. That's an organization that's still running today. He advocated for the creation of this group, and he was named the president of the ATP in 1974. So this is still early on in his professional career, right? He graduated college, not not super early, but he graduated in college in 1966, and he's the president of all tennis players in 1974. So he's just like about 30 years old at this point. They named him the president of the ATP, ATP, which is to protect the interest of all players, to make sure they can get into the right tournaments and, and run things. So there's another achievement for our boy, Arthur, two-time slam champion, and now he's the president of the ATP. This is around the same time where a lot of professional sports were were kind of battling within each other with multiple leagues, multiple groups. Boxing's like really the only one that's still fighting it. I don't know why they're holding on to so many different belts and championships and and all that stuff, but you had you had professional American football dealing with their stuff, you had the NBA emerging around this time too and you had you had all the uh, the baseball leagues trying to pop up and take over and and, and all of that stuff. So it's, this seems par for the course for me in the yeah. professional sports landscape in the 70s because we were just – Americans were just real confused about what we actually wanted in professional sports. And then today, nothing crazy – I mean, nothing crazy has happened really since this time because the MLB was established. The NFL merger happened. The, the NBA, ABA merger happened. And, and all these things happened around the same time. So it's interesting that tennis also – not a victim because it wasn't necessarily a bad thing. They were still sorting themselves out, but it seems that it seems that he joined and became the president of the one who would last. It'd be like the first commissioner of the NBA who like made the merger, who led them to superiority over the others and, and, and went on and lived in history kind of thing. Also, we're definitely not going to have to do an episode on Lamar hunt because We've mentioned him so many times <laughs> that I think we know, I keep thinking we know everything that he's done and everything he's touched, but clearly I'm wrong. So maybe we will. Maybe we will have to talk we'll just, about him one day. We'll just do a super cut of all of our Lamar Hunt <laughs> references and then stitch them together and there, there will be our episode. <laughs> um, this leads us into the 1975 edition of the Wimbledon championships it was ashes night the tipped at wimbledon and he came in as the sixth seed this is a pretty good story here he reaches the final against jimmy connors and there's a lot of of kind of background and context to this uh final matchup ash had never beaten jimmy connors head to head in any match at any point in his career he had never beaten jimmy connors Connors came into the final having ne- having not dropped a set in the tournament so far. He'd played six matches. He'd won all six in straight sets. So he's looking to do something that only a handful of people have ever done in, in winning a slam without dropping a set. Connors was also in the process of suing the ATP for $10 million because they had just left him out of the French Open. Uh, He was part of a deal where he didn't play in the Davis Cup, and so they said, you're not playing in the French Open, then sorry. He was also suing Ash himself for $5 million for libel, because Ash had done some, as as the head of the ATP, uh, he had done some interviews criticizing Connors. So we got a lawsuit going on, we got Connors looking for history, and we've got the fact that Ash has never won. And Ash went full petty for the whole situation. So... He wore red, white, and blue, all-American stuff uh, onto the Wimbledon court because it's an all-American final, so he's playing into this. He wore a Davis Cup warm-up jacket onto the court (laughs) in any time he could, and he wore it after the match. And in the match, this is where the the serve and volley style that I was talking about comes up. Uh, the, the people who reported on the match said that it was kind of a virtuistic, virtu, virtuos, virtuoso. What is the what is the action of being a, a virtuoso? 
Who I think, knows? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't want. I'm not going to be wrong on international radio. International. You know what? It is. Shout out to our listeners in France. Who knows? <laughs> it is. I think it's virtuistic. Virtue. Whatever. He was a virtuoso that day on the tennis court. <laughs> Um, he was just playing all kinds of shots, lobs and slices, and just putting the ball where Connors couldn't do anything with it. Uh, and he was just at the net, just all over the place, protecting. And he ends up winning the final. So what does he do for the trophy ceremony? If you, you know, if you know, in tennis, the trophy ceremony, the the runner up gets the runner up trophy, and the champion gets the champion trophy. Right? It's not like golf where the guy that finished second just disappears and goes home. The runner-up's still there, so he puts back on the Davis Cup warm-up just so he can show off to Connors some more. So it's just a, it's kind of a cool story where he's like, "Oh yeah, you want to sue me? Sue this." <laughs> you gotta love these stories too because he he was able to show up and wear what he was wearing, say what he said beforehand, and bring it on the court too because there are there have been situations where people with really loud mouths outside of competition just get embarrassed conor mcgregor in recent memory comes to mind i was about to say conor mcgregor (laughs) (laughs) and so like he that's a different episode but ash shows up doing his thing and he plays a style that Connors was apparently not ready for, or he just outplayed him that day, or both. And so you have to you have to you have to tip your hat to to Ash for coming up with coming up with the win there. That's again just another another feather in his cap for 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 his life achievement stuff. So it's amazing. So he wins his third Grand Slam there, and he would become the world's number one player in 1975. Uh, only one of 59 people to this day who have ever been number one in the world. Now, this does come with a little bit of controversy. If you look this up, you will see it starred in various places because the ATP had just created a computer ranking system. It was new and it's not a person. So all of the tennis journalists kind of did a little hand wringing there. The, the the ATP rankings say that Connors was the number one player, but and to Ash's credit, none of the people agreed. Everybody that had a publication that ranked players at the end of the year ranked Ash as the number one player, and so he is officially listed as a number one for 1975. And again, he's only one of 59 people in history that has achieved that. While he's a professional, he does use his platform to raise awareness on social issues. Again, that's not a new thing. Um, while he's a, while he's playing, apartheid in South Africa, which is uh, very similar in, in some ways to segregation here in America, but apartheid in South Africa, so in some ways more intense, uh, was still going on in South Africa while he was playing. And he continuously applied for admission to play in a tournament in South Africa year after year after year. And they continued to deny him year after year after year. But in the seventies world attention started being placed on South Africa in a negative way. They were, they were uh, kind of barred from Olympic competition and in an attempt to try and get back in their good graces with the Olympics, they did invite Ash to come play in South Africa. He made the final of that tournament two years in a row, losing to Connors because the, the, the first time he beat him was at Wimbledon. Uh, but he lost to Connors twice. His idea was that if he could go, he could show up, he could play in front of those people, he could interact with people, he could help break down stereotypes and help lead to the end of apartheid quicker. But that didn't come to be. And he would later kind of recant that statement and say, look, I it didn't really do any good. I was wrong for trying to play and I'm not going there anymore until they fix it. Uh, and he he would continue to have success. He actually won uh, the French Open in doubles in 1977. But in that year, he suffered a heel injury 
And because of the lack of playing, because of the recovery, it was kind of an intense recovery period. He fell down to the triple digits in the world rankings. He was number one in 1975. By 1977, he's in the triple digits. Eventually, he did recover. And in 1979, he shot, and this is at the age of 35, too. We're talking about 1979 medicine now. So it ain't 2021. Where we've got what like these fantastic surgeries with with increasingly small you know recovery times. He's thirty five in nineteen seventy nine. He fought back and climbs back to number thirteen in the world rankings in nineteen seventy nine. He became the ATP's comeback player of the year that year, but then he had to retire. He actually suffered a heart attack in a clinic. Given a clinic, suffered a heart attack. And he had to have a quadruple bypass. He's only 35 years old, which is crazy. He's 35. He's an athlete, world-class athlete. But remember, his mother died early on. She was actually only like 27 years old um, So and had died of a heart attack. His father had had his first heart attack in his 50s. So he's got a history of, of heart disease, which is you know, just another terrible thing. Uh, and so he had, you know, he had a heart attack at 35 years old. And had to retire from the game of tennis. You really hate to to see things like this ruin a professional athlete's career. And not to say he was 35 already, and, but he did come back after that heel injury and shot all the way back up and became the comeback player of the year that year. And you, you, you still always have to wonder what if, right? You always have to go through that in your head, and you think, well, if he hadn't if he hadn't hurt himself with that heel injury, fallen so far behind, or once he did get back up to thirteen, if the heel injury had happened, if 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 he didn't have such a family history of heart disease and have a heart attack at the age of thirty five years old and have to have a quadruple bypass, like what what could have been? He's already he's already won three majors, and he was. He's been doing this his entire life. It's probably all he knows. And you just hate it for for people who have their careers shortened because of something other than them just wanting to go. Something something outside of just your desire to play the game anymore yeah. stopping you from doing it. Because you you just want to see. You just want to see him them be great. You want to see them continue to be great for as long as they can. And then something like this happens. And, and it goes further than that because to your credit, you know, he fought back from the heel injury. He's actually, he actually fights back to try and, and make a comeback to tennis after the quadruple bypass. And it turns out in 1983, he needs to have a second bypass. So he's in the process. He's trying to train to, to at least, at least be able to play tennis, at least be able to go out and do, you know, stuff. Uh, you know, whether it's, you know, a champions tour or, or give clinics or just play exhibitions, maybe not even if he doesn't make the, the pro tour again, but he has trouble. He has chest pain in 1983 and he needs to have a second bypass in 1983. But in typical Ash fashion, he makes the best of the situation. He uh, becomes the American Heart Association's uh, campaign, national campaign chairman. So this this is an issue that is affecting him. So he throws himself into it, just like he had into his tennis career. He becomes uh, again the the campaign chairman for the American Heart Association. Uh, later on, about five years later, nineteen eighty eight, he suffered paralysis in his right arm, and after going through several treatments, he had uh, kind of an emergency brain surgery where the results of which, through the results of which, they did some more screenings and they discovered uh, that he had AIDS. They believed that he had contracted the HIV virus from a blood transfusion that was actually performed during that second 1983 bypass. Again, AIDS at that point, very new to the world. So not necessarily something, I'm assuming not something that it would have been, that was screened for, just kind of they didn't know. And so they just assumed that's where he got it from. But he used this, he used this to his advantage too. At first they kept it quiet. Uh, there was a lot of stigma attached to being diagnosed with AIDS, especially in the eighties. 
he kept it quiet, but eventually went public with his diagnosis and led efforts at the United Nations to get the United Nations to fundraise uh, for potential treatments or cures and to convince members of the United Nations that this was a world problem that should be tackled by the world. So he's even using the platform he generated as this tennis player to do, you know, something about his current situation and not just his, his current situation. Like we had talked about his, his deal with apartheid. He was arrested in 1985. He'd had two heart surgeries by this point, And he was at a protest against apartheid in Washington, DC and was arrested in 1985. And then in 1992, He's a person that's had two bypasses and he he is stricken with AIDS. He's arrested in 1992 at a protest over the way the U.S. government was handling some Haitian refugees. And he was arrested in a protest again. So he's continuing to use his platform all over everywhere, uh, even after he's not a pro athlete anymore. Just a, a couple of examples there. You have to appreciate that because you never know. We'll never know. We'll never be able to quantify his efforts, right? We'll never be able to say him being who he was and him speaking out when he did, like how many people did he help? How many lives did he save? But him coming out with and and and, and speaking about his own health issues with between the American Heart Association and the United Nations work to combat AIDS in the world. He made an impact. There's no doubt in my mind that people listened to him. And it's because of how good he was at his sport originally. Like I said earlier, you no one's going to listen to someone who's bad at their sport about something else, right? I think of uh, I think of Maya Moore, who just recently won this award for giving up her basketball career, basically. She's all-time great. UConn player, all-time great WNBA player, giving up her career to fight for something she believes in off the court. And her using her her using her platform that she successfully built over the years through sport made such an impact off the court. And you have to you have to appreciate the work that they're doing because to some people go through life and never feel that passionate about anything. And they'll never, and they'll they'll just never know how how good it feels to love something as much as they love their sports, and then to go on away from that, even even in some cases, just drop it cold and give it up, just to fight for something else they believe in. It's amazing work. It really is. Yeah, uh, it truly is. Uh, some of his other achievements, um, not even not even in the social kind of social justice field, it, just some of the other things he did. He created the National Junior Tennis League, uh, which uh, obviously is to get young people involved in tennis. He wrote a three-volume work, not just a book, three-volume work on African-American athletes entitled A Hard Road to Glory. And that's something that was made into a documentary uh, later as well. He was named Sports Illustrated Sportsman of the Year in 1990. Two. Remember, he retired back in 1979. He was the Sportsman of the Year in 1992 because of of some of these kind of humanitarian or this humanitarian work that he did. Uh, but unfortunately, he did pass away in 1993 as a result of complications from pneumonia. That same year, he was posthumously given the Presidential Medal of Freedom again in 1993. We know that the that ESPN named their Courage Award the Arthur Ashe Award for Courage. We've mentioned that uh, before. And in 1997, a new stadium was built for tennis to house the U.S. Open. Uh, kind of center court for the U.S. Open is named Arthur Ashe Stadium. And it is, I didn't realize this until researching it, it's the largest tennis stadium in the world. And it was big. It seats all. It's it seats twenty three thousand over twenty three thousand. It's nearly twenty four thousand. So it's essentially it's an essentially an NBA or NHL arena that they, they play tennis in, and that's amazing to me. That's awesome. I wish I played tennis so that I could like dream of playing in Arthur Ashe Stadium. Uh, it's one of the the prime venues in the world, and it's 
named for Arthur Ashe. I want to see the stadium because I've seen it on television and, and, and not just for not just for tennis competition, but for other competition. And it is a it is a beautiful thing. Like to be such a large stadium built for tennis, largest in the world, right here in New York. And yep. just for us to have that, I would love to see that. If I ever go if I ever go like touristy in New York, I, I this is on this is on the list. Just to drive by it. I mean, just to drive by it, it's gonna look like I mean, yeah, like you said, it's gonna look like a basketball arena, not a tennis court. But there's a tennis court in there. That's the primary purpose. And it's been there for 25 years almost. And I don't think it's been renovated or anything. It's the way it sits now is the way that it was built. And I would, I, I would, I would really love to see a sporting event in there, but, but, it, um, la- yeah. overall though, learning about all of this, all of his stuff, like I said earlier, I think I didn't know nearly enough about what he did on the court. Only, only some of the things that he was doing off the court. And that's why, the the SB award comes to mind so prominently, but knowing I have a I have a totally different respect for him for that award, what it means because of everything that he did off the court and how good of an athlete he was at a time where in the fifties when he was just learning how to play tennis, a guy in the city of Chicago had to sue the city just to get African Americans ability the, give the African Americans in the city the, the ability to use the city's tennis courts. He made it made it through everything losing his mom at the age of six, all the way to all of his social justice issues, if you will, and all of his health issues that he spoke out on and did and did a lot of work for too. So really glad we talked about them because again, I don't think he's we I may say this at the end of every episode if we talk about somebody in particular, but he's not talked about enough. Just having an SB award isn't enough. Uh, some some final fast facts on Arthur Ashe. He is one of only 57 men in the history of tennis to win three or more Grand Slams. If you uh, include only the Open era, he's one of only 21 men to win three or more Grand Slams. His uh, 45 tournament titles are 16th all time, which surprised me that he's that high on the list. And his 793 match wins are 11th all time in the open era. And he was the first African-American inducted into the Tennis Hall of Fame in 1985. And I'm going to leave you with one of his most famous and his best quotes. True heroism is remarkably sober, very undramatic. It is not the urge to surpass all others at whatever cost but the urge to serve others at whatever cost. Beautiful. We'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of What You Don't Know About Sports. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please leave us a review, five stars only please, and hit that subscribe button wherever you listen. If you have a great sports story, we want to hear about it. You can connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at WYDKAS Podcast, and on our YouTube channel at What You Don't Know About Sports Podcast. All episodes are written, recorded, and edited by us. Stay tuned for the next episode. We'll figure it out. It's the motto. YOLO. (laughs)